thanks for tuning in to the Just Go Play podcast, where we look to develop and promote a positive youth sports experience. As always, we are available for speaking and private engagements and can be reached at info at justgoplay.ca. You can also catch full video versions of our podcast on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to visit us at justgoplay.ca. Enjoy the episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Just Go Play show. I'm here with Matt and Lisa, my great hosts. I'm looking forward to today's conversation. How you guys doing? Matt, how you doing? Good, man. Lisa? I'm doing great, bud. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. First I'm question. Looking forward to today. Looking forward to today. Yeah? Good. Because this is right up your alley, Lisa. Matt, this, first, this one's for you. Should we assess kids? I get uh-huh. it. There's, there's lots of schools of thought on this. We're starting you off with you. Should we assess yeah. kids? Yeah, of course we should. We assess kids in every other subject matter. I'm assuming that you're referring to physical education physical. or sport. Yes. What's the context? Is that the context? Yeah, then absolutely. Okay. Yeah. We should absolutely assess kids in, in their proficiency because if you don't know where you started, how do you know where you're going and how do you know if you're making progress towards where it is that you want to be? So I absolutely think we should be assessing kids. I think it's the first thing that we should be doing. Um, There's lots of gray area around how to evaluate. And I know you have a lot of experience in that as a physical education teacher. And we talked about it lots of times. How do you, how do you give A's and B's? And I think when you get to that conversation and I'm looking forward to Elisa's input too, it's all about you versus you. So in the past where I think we've done a, a disservice is we've, we've paired the performance or the, the, the kids up against a, a normative standard. So they've always been compared to something versus compared to themselves. So there's always been this, this belief that, oh, well, I don't stack up. Um, you don't take early maturation into account. You don't take um, the, the early adapters, the people that are multi-sport inclined, the better athletes. Um, so I think that that's a, an area that we can review, but getting back to your original question, should we assess athletes and physical education and sport? That should be the first thing that's done in my opinion. Elisa? Yeah, no, perfect. It's, it's, here's another one where we all agree on this. I think assessment is paramount to anything you're doing. Kids, youth, adults, older adults, whoever you're working with in whatever context, if you don't assess, you guess. And now I'm just looking at how am I going to understand what to to help this person with, what programming to give, what lessons to bring, what qualities I think that they can improve on in order to become the best version of themselves. If I'm not doing some form of assessment, how am I gonna know that? I gotta take a guess. And maybe I'm gonna take a guess based on those norms, based on while they're 13, therefore this, based on, well, I know, I know you come from a whatever sport background, a soccer background, a hockey background, therefore I'm gonna guess you need these things. But that's not the proper way for us to do this. We have excellent assessment tools. And whether it's the scientific tools, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, we have excellent resources we can use to assess. Now, you asked a really good question, Matt, assessment versus evaluation. And I think where assessment gets a dirty word is when it's done negatively to shame people. And that's what we really need to focus on is how can we make assessment a quality component of training or of a program where it's looking at helping someone elevate to the next level they want to be in all aspects of their physical, emotional, cognitive development. And that's really the crux of it. So it's really on us to deliver proper assessments. Two things I love there. If you ain't assessing, you guessing. I'm, I'm stealing yeah. that. I'm using that. Because uh, there is too many people guessing. I like that too. There's too many people guessing. But let's, let's actually, because we're about solutions. So, uh, you know, the question that you ask about standard of, normative standards uh, versus individual progress. Let's talk to the PE specialist and teacher, Daryl. What, what do we do? How do people assess? Because that seems to be one of the areas that people want the most amount of help. How do we properly assess kids in physical education? How do we properly assess kids in sport? What's your view? Well, this is a good question. Um, I, I got to remind me, I got a question for you too, Lisa, after this. Uh, the challenge we have, well, I can tell you when I was a school teacher, the challenge we had in phys ed is that not everybody was on the same page. We talk about organizational alignment. 
not every teacher assessed the kids the same way. The phys ed teacher I, I, with their class, they might have assessed them differently. They were looking for different things. One teacher was looking for something else. One was looking for something else. We don't have a common assessment. The tools, they, what tools? You know, Lisa, you talked about tools. Not everybody knows what tools to use or what system. And when I, when I was assessing kids, I was, I was blown away by, by the lack of fundamental skills they did have that I had to go back and sort of recreate, meet them where they were and say, okay, what can you do today on your first day? And you said it, Matt, it's you versus you, not comparing them to anybody else. And we did basic things like push-ups, sit-ups, um, the, the run tests. And I said, okay, wherever you are today, today's a zero day, guys. And whatever you get, that's what you get. And then we are going to practice we're going to practice these things. And as your skills uh, over the course of the year, they will improve and then we're gonna retest you. And we're gonna measure where you've started and where you're gonna get to. Now, when we did that, we had some parents that were, you know, there was not some parents, some kids that came up to me and said, how do I get an A, Daryl? And I said, that, I thought that was a good question because there were some guys in my class that were really bright and they had A's and everything, but they weren't athletic. They said, I'm not athletic. I need to get an A in here, Daryl. So they busted their chops in the beginning. They improved. They did everything I asked. And, you know, they were able to do five push-ups in the beginning of the year. By the end of the year, they could do 20. I gave that kid an A. And there were some kids in the class that were pissed off because they got 20 push-ups at the beginning of the year. You go, how did that guy get an A? So what I did was I met them where they were and I measured their growth and I helped them with their growth. So that's, and I go, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but in terms of for teachers in school, we need to measure their growth and help them develop as opposed to, to measure them against some standard against somebody else. Because if they see growth, then they, and they know they can get better, then they're going to keep doing it later on in life when they're outside of school. Hey, I can get better. I got better at running. I got better at push-ups. Got my strength went up. My speed, my endurance went up. This is where I, I, I go back to teachers and say, the, the, you know, we talked about the principles of fitness, Matt, you and me in a conversation the other day. This is where they have to start. The baseline, and you said it, everyone has to be assessed. And I'm rambling right now, but I'm, I, I, I know that's where they have to start. You have to meet them where they are with a baseline test. And I call it a zero day. What is so, so two, zero? So two, that's great. So two things that I'm taking away from that, Daryl, are number one is you versus you. Um, don't worry about everyone else. And number two, you are able to, to frame it up in, and have that conversation, which is really important to say, it's not about where you are today. It's what we're going to do to improve. And then actually the third thing that, I like that you actually factored into that, which may seem obvious, but it's subsequent days of practice and physical education, we're actually working on improving those baseline metrics, which may seem like, well, of course they were, but not everyone does that. Sometimes we take an assessment and valuation. We don't ever even revisit the things that we were assessing. And then when it comes time to reassess, we're like, well, hang on a second. We haven't even practiced any of this. We're just assuming that it's going to get better because uh, of osmosis. So those are three things that stood out for me, for you. Elisa, I got a question for you. What would be, and then back to Daryl, what would be your, a comprehensive level of assessment in physical education? So Elisa, you're now a physical education teacher, or you're talking to a physical education teacher. There's great debate on what do we assess? Do, are, are we just assessing the physical skills or is there something else? What is your idea of a, and we don't have to go through the different age and stage appropriate assessments, just a good all overall comprehensive assessment of physical education. Yeah, no, yeah, fantastic question. And to your point, Daryl, there's so many tools, but which one does it all? None of them. Which one looks at everything that, you know, we're trying to measure in a school setting, in a sports setting, in a parks and rec setting? None of them. Which one are people trained to deliver with any kind of consistency? None of them. So it's a really tough thing to say, you know, this is what we're going to do. And then in a school setting, you're also bound by curriculum. So we look at a math teacher. A math teacher is bound by curriculum of normative standards that these kids have to meet, unless schools changed since I was there. 
So in the PE space, and now PE, again, is delivered mostly around the world by generalist teachers who don't have that training. So we need to go back and look at well, what kind of training are we giving them? To your question, Matt, I would look at a number of things. You mentioned the fundamentals of fitness, Daryl, 100%. Measure the fundamentals of fitness because that is a key component for any kind of movement capacity. But we also need to look at some of more emotional qualitative things around how much do you enjoy moving? What kind of movement do you like? Are you good at teamwork? Do you work hard work with uh, dedication and discipline? So some of those more life skills we need to assess. Now, my whole world is built around physical literacy and the physical literacy assessment debate is very, very big, but it's looking at measuring a number of things. So competence, the physical skills, and Daryl, you mentioned fundamental movement skills, those need to be assessed. Fundamental movement skills for sure, things like running and throwing and kicking outside of a sport context. Confidence, now measuring confidence is very, very difficult. And motivation, how do you measure someone's motivation, their drive, their grit, their determination? These are some things that we need to measure. I don't know of any comprehensive measurement that measures all of them in one. You might have to pull something together yourself based on what's out there and what bounds you're restricted by, again, where your curriculum is or where your training programs are. Really yeah, you know, a really good point, Lisa, because really it's important to, you know, what you've highlighted is there's lots of tools out there, but really doesn't that boil down to a segment we had a long time ago? What's your culture? What are your values? So whatever that culture of values is for the sport organization or the education system, that's really what you want to then measure because that becomes the backstop and it's consistent. So I just want to go back to a couple things you said. So if our listeners don't know, you know, let's break down what is competence. So competence is two things. Number one, it's physical. So, and Daryl and you both have mentioned the kind of seven uh, fundamentals of physical fitness, speed, so how fast you are, strength, how strong you are, endurance, your, your heart, your cardiac capabilities, uh, agility, your, your quickness laterally side to side, balance, flexibility, and there's one more because there's seven. Yeah, what have I missed? Uh, power. power. So those are the seven characteristics of physical fitness, right? That They are staples. So at any way, at any time in a physical, physical education, even in a sport environment, we want to be tracking, recording, and reporting where kids are across age and stage appropriate evaluations or, or, or metrics for those seven things. Because like you said, Elisa, that's life. And Daryl, you mentioned it too. It's not just sport. It's not just PE. Those are life skills. Power, being able to push something. Uh, strength, you're, you know, being able to function fluidly, balance you know, being, be, these are, these are life skills and that's why it's even more important to do that. And Daryl, bringing it back to you at the beginning of this conversation, that's how you framed it up for the kids as a teacher. It wasn't about the performance based outcomes. It was about using these indicators for movement. And then Elisa, you brought it in with the definition of physical literacy. So I think that's important. So First of all, out of the competence, we're talking about competence, we're talking about physical competence, those are the seven components of physical fitness. Okay, so if you're given an evaluation, no matter what your evaluation includes, it's got to include your progress across those things. That's first. Second, then you get into the technical, tactical competence. So that's when you start getting into the games, that's when you start getting into the introduction to gymnastics, to, to volleyball, to basketball, to floor hockey to all of the sports that we see in physical education. So again, there's got to be a, uh, you know, you don't have to, there doesn't have to be a substantive list. You, you, you create some things. Can they stick it? Can they dribble? So the fundamental sports sport skills. And basically there should be an evaluation on those fundamental sports skills. And again, like Daryl said, it's you versus you. Where did you start the year? Where did you finish the year? And I think that this is where physical education, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, gets into problems because everyone goes, well, I'm not an athlete, not an all-star athlete. It's not about being an all-star athlete. Let's, let's shelve that narrative for a second because that is just an excuse and reason that's given up by lazy people to not evaluate or assess kids, okay? They, they use that, that whole fear thing. Uh, and we need to shelve that because again, these are skills that are important. So that's the competence, the physical and the technical tactical. And Elisa, then you got into the confidence. So that's like self-belief, self-worth, resilience. 
And there are a lot of good tools. USA Quality Coach Framework, uh, Wade Gilbert, Dr. Wade Gilbert broke those down. And what are they? And how do you measure them? And what kind of definition is that? And you could put rubrics in. I think what's important is you can have kids self-evaluate and the teacher evaluate because then you're getting both sides of, of the coin and you're, you're engaging the kids in that process. So the confidence is, is a big piece. Then we've got the connection because let's not fool ourselves. Physical education always gets the, the label of, well, everyone's just goofing off. Oh, it's just a social emotional. That is the social emotional and sports are social emotional. You meet people, you meet new friends, you learn all the life skills, winning, losing, victory, defeat. It is social emotional. So there's got to be some indicators on connection for social emotional learning. And then lastly is character. So that's the mental psychological learning, focus, game sense, uh, effort, attitude. And again, there's been a lot of good work that's been done. And Lisa, you, you kept coming back to this, which is great. There's a lot of tools that exist in the toolbox. You just have to pick out the right ones for you and make sure they're consistent from the beginning of the year until the end of the year. And then at the end of the year, if you want to change them, if you want to modify them, if you want to get more complex as the kids get older, if you want to get less complex as the kids are younger, that to me is a comprehensive assessment model that would then help physical education gain the footing that it really needs to be valued and, and validated. Daryl? You know what, man, you said several great things there. One thing I want to take away and, and go back to the, the teaching, self-awareness. You, you, you talked about that um, in, in one of the, the, the levels that these kids, when, when they don't have self-awareness, they don't know if they're, they're good enough or they'd have the skills to play something. They don't have that awareness. They won't want to do stuff. And I know this, and you talked about the sports skills. I purposely brought in uh, ultimate Frisbee. I know no one knew how to throw a Frisbee. It was even playing field for everyone. I told them, guys, in the beginning of the year, uh, our games are probably not going to be that good. So we have to learn how to throw the Frisbee and catch the Frisbee. If we learn how to throw the Frisbee and catch the Frisbee, we're going to have way better games. We're going to have way more fun. So we worked on throwing and passing and catching and all that stuff and moving and playing. And next thing you know, we had these small little games and they loved it. They were, they, this, I'm using that example because I want people to see these people did not know how to play ultimate Frisbee at the beginning of the year. By the end of the year, kids were coming in, uh, athletic kids, kids that weren't that athletic. Can we play ultimate Frisbee today? That's the, like that. It was to me, if, if I did nothing with those kids, I know some of those kids now they'll go to the beach and they'll throw a Frisbee and they'll be like, Hey, let's go play because they didn't have that skill set, self-awareness. I gave them, I said, Hey guys, here's the, here's the beginning. We don't know how to do this right now. We don't know how to catch. We don't know how to throw. But if we learn these things, we're going to have fun here. And I put that all together for these guys as a teacher, as a unit. And then next thing you know, by the end of the year, we had a confident, competent group that all wanted to play Ultimate Frisbee. So, again, um, you know, we, we're talking about a lot of tools and whatnot. But it doesn't have to be so complicated. Matt, you're, you're amazing at making things simple. You know, that is a simple example of why we need to assess, why we need to have a process, a beginning and end, and, and, and what is going to help teachers, what's going to help kids, and, and have them playing for their whole lives or being active for their whole lives. So I don't know if anyone wants to add to that, but yes, at least I know someone who's dying to say something. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Both you guys, magnificent point. Matt, you mentioned the four C's. Perfect. I want you to tell people when I, when I give you a second to talk, I want you to tell people where they can find that information because that's crucial. The fact that Wade Gilbert has information about, you know, how we're looking at assessing confidence crucial because that doesn't exist. And that's people don't assess sometimes because they're afraid of what they're doing. So if they're afraid of doing something that might be damaging, because assessment could be damaging if you don't do it right, but so could any, so could Tylenol if you don't take it right. So anything you could do could be damaging. There shouldn't be a reason we don't do it. What we need to do is invest in training, resources, and the value around what you do with that assessment. You said it, Matt. 
you, t- you take assessment and then you just forget about it. You don't do anything with it the rest of the year. And so when you baseline and you develop a plan based on that, and then you look at assessing at some point in the future and at the end of whatever your season or your program, because you can assess in any setting, whether it's recreation or sport or school or your home life, your personal life. It's really important to look at back at those assessments as well to, to gain that confidence of, look at how far you've, you've grown. I love what you said, Daryl, measure of growth. It's not a measure of how good or bad you are. It's a measure of growth. How much have you grown since the last time we looked at this skill or ideology or perception, whatever that is. And that's a really important thing for kids, especially to see, but adults too, to, to build their confidence, but also show that you're, I've met a lot of kids who think that they're superstars at seven years old. You're not the best at seven years old. You've got a lot you can, you can accomplish. So we're, we're not pushing these kids far enough. And I want to bring it back. We were just talking before we, we press record about the Michael Jordan documentary. And one of the most amazing things we see, and we always talk about pro sports, is multi-sport athletes. Jordan had the confidence, and this is a spoiler alert, if anyone hasn't seen it yet, turn, put it on mute for right now. Jordan had the confidence to go from basketball, pro basketball, and then go and try and make a run for pro baseball. Same with Bo Jackson and lots of other athletes who have done similar things where they try it. Where did he get that confidence? And like you said, Daryl, if you give them that ability to learn those skills and feel like they can develop a wide variety of skills, they can embark in anything in life, whether it's a social endeavor, like you said, Matt, social, emotional, whether it's a business endeavor where they realize, you know, they have the determination to go past something or whether it's a personal ascent into, you know, I want to improve my fitness to, to improve my health for the long run. There's so many reasons why, and a lot of it comes back down to assessment. And you said it as well, Daryl, self-assessment. The opportunity for someone to be able to look at themselves and say, what can I work on to be better? And it's, that's not a bad thing. We need to frame it in a positive. And there, the benefits of it are, are outstanding. So I just want yeah, to add that in there. The framing is really important because, you know, the counterpunch to all of our conversations today would be, well, I had a bad experience. And Elisa, you talked about this and, and physical education teachers were in our, in our past podcast is PE dead. Um, you know, a lot of the reality is we get some physical education teachers in the, in teaching phys ed that have had a really bad experience, particularly around assessment, that flexed arm hang, the humiliation in front of everybody. Um, and, you know, so what we're saying is, and then I feel like the physical education sector on whole gets caught up in this academic, you know, paralysis by analysis, where if it's not perfect and the, and the language isn't perfect and the definitions aren't perfect, we focus all the time on that instead of just doing something, instead of just going out, selecting your criterion, making sure that they're consistent from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, working inside your, your, your toolkit and, and rolling it out and having enough self-awareness like Daryl said to say okay this isn't for this kid or this isn't for this grade or this isn't we need to change this or at this period of time in life this is more important than this so we're going to put a heavier weight on this so bringing in those different um, aspects of of that assessment and I feel like again the, the the physical education sector gets so caught up you know they get in their own way and they become their own barrier um now are we done this can, can we can we now talk about and, and move out of phys ed, physical education into the sport, into the youth sport sector and assessment? Are we ready to do that? Or you guys have a few more questions? I, I, I think Carol? so. I just want to add one last thing and, and why this assessment thing is a problem. And Elisa, you said it, it's because they're not confident in, in their assessment of kids. That, that's why it's not happening. Yeah. They're, they're not confident. And, and maybe they don't trust the tools. Maybe they don't trust their observation because they don't want to give the wrong assessment. They don't want to give the wrong ops, observe the wrong thing and say, I don't know if he's getting better. I don't know. So if you don't know, you're not going to do it. It's not going to be your, st- we stay away from the things we don't feel confident about. And I, I think you, you, you hit it. Why isn't it happening? Why is phys ed in trouble? Is because we don't assess. Yes. But I think we're afraid to assess, as you said, Matt, because again, t- assessing someone's like a judgment. We feel like the assessment is yeah. the same as judgment. It's not judgment. We're trying to help you. I think so. But it's okay to tell That's a kid that they're, it's okay, okay to give a, a kid a, a grade in math uh, or, or a grade yeah. in, in, in science or any other 
any other arena, but we shy away from it in physical education, which has been, in my opinion, the, the, the death, uh, has led to the death of physical education because it's not, then people aren't, it's, what's, there's no legitimacy around it. Like, why bother? Why am I bothering? I'm not getting better. How do I connect all that stuff? Okay, so moving on. One more thing, one more thing on that. If we aren't preparing these mini assessments, you know, these small assessments on things like developing a sports skill or developing a movement skill, developing confidence to want to, if we're not helping kids learn, I'm going to start here and I'm going to work hard in order to get better, later in life when they're incest, in university, in business, in their personal health, they're not going to know what to do. So if you don't want to assess because you don't like it, you had a bad experience, whatever, and I've heard all the reasons I've had my own bad experiences, I know all of them. If you don't want to do that, at least look at the value of assessment to help set that little person up for later in life when you know they will be assessed. And if they aren't prepared for that assessment and that judgment that they're going to get later in life, you haven't done a good job preparing them for that because you didn't have the desire to assess them then and prepare them. So that's another reason I think it's really important for us to assess. You're going to be assessed all through life, especially with social media now. You're judged all the time. So let's, let's help train people how to go from where they are today to where they want to be and what they need to do to get there. That's it. Yeah. Sorry. And, now we can and, Amen. Well, no, not because you've opened up another box, which is the uh, importance of also including people's goals. What are your goals? So in addition to all the stuff that we, we've done, there should be also an opportunity for the young girls and boys to insert their goals. What do you want to achieve? What do you want to do? And, you know, lots of times they're going to go, well, I don't have one. I don't want to, I don't have anything. Okay, perfect. Well, we're going to, then what we're going to do is we're going to assess across these things. And then you can come back and tell me after we've done this, if you want to set any goals around this or something else. And that goes back to what Daryl said, meeting people where they are, knowing what people want to do. I want to look better. I want to feel better. That, those are the, how you weave those conversations in. So quick story, uh, personal training, back to the personal training days. Every single person that Matt Young trained had a goal. They had to have a goal. No plan, no purpose, no point. I was not the celebrity trainer that just wanted to take your money and, and not have you do anything. It was a insult. So everyone had a goal. One woman, never forget her. I am jumped off the treadmill mid-side. I stop pushing goals on me. I'm not running a five kilometer. I do not want to run a half marathon. I just want to come here and release stress. I'm, I'm getting stressed out that you're putting all this pressure on me. Hey, no problem. No problem whatsoever. I go, I'm just trying to figure out how to, you know, deliver um, a, a, a session that you enjoy. And so she goes, well, I really like running, but I'm not going to run a, a half marathon distance. I'm not like all these other women that, that have this goal. I go, hey, no problem. So I said, what we'll do is every week we'll build. And so every week, nine o'clock, there we were. First, we were out and back, 10 minutes, off and puffing. Then we did some gym work. Second week, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. You guys know where this is going. By the end of the fourth week, I had to move the hour that was after her because we were running an hour and a half and talking, listening, getting fit, feeling better. Comes in two weeks later. I don't even say a word. So not two weeks, after the four weeks. Six weeks later, we finish an hour and 45 minute run. And I, I'm not even saying anything. She goes, holy smokes. She goes, that was a long time. How many kilometers do you think that was? I go, oh, that was 25 kilometers. And she goes, 25 kilometers. She goes, well, how far is a half marathon? I go, it's 21 kilometers. She goes, so I just ran a half marathon. I go, you sure did. And she's like, so I can do it. And I was like, yeah, you can if you want to, but you said you didn't want to. Well, now, I, now that I know I'm ready, I'm going to try it. So then she went out and ran a half marathon and it was one of the best experiences in her life. So again, bringing, not about me, about her and about some of the barriers that we see and some of the reservations about being compared, not wanting to be untimed, uh, not wanting to formalize anything, and different strategies that we can use to connect with those people to lead them to their own, and that's what you're saying, Daryl, their own aha moment, and at least uh, their own yay, I did it, did it moment. So there's lots of ways that we can do that, but I think we get so stuck, and again, we don't have the confidence. We, it's not in the curriculum. It's not in the box. It's outside the box. For all these reasons, we just completely go, okay, we're not doing anything. And I think that's a mistake. 100. Amen, brother. Darryl? That, that woman just didn't want to fail from the sound of it. She Correct. didn't want to fail. Yeah. 
Now, let's take it to the sports. Or be compared. Well, yeah, or be compared. You're right, to the other women or whatever they were doing. And um, I, I love those personal training stories, uh, personally. But sport time. Every organization, I feel, well, should be testing their kids at the beginning of the year, regardless. And I don't care. And I think it should be done at the community center. I think it should be done friggin' at the daycare. I don't care what it is, figure out something. They should be tested or assessed. I don't like that word testing because no one likes a test. Assessed. I don't care if it's tw twiddlywinks. They should be assessed. Where are you today? Okay. I got experience doing assessments in the early years setting. It's observational at that point. But even before that, from zero to about two years old, we're doing very, very direct assessments of do they crawl? Do they pull the stand? Do they take their first steps at the right time? We're very critical in those first few stages. And we know if those developmental windows are closed before they reach that skill, we got to call every doctor and specialist that's out there to get them moving forwards. So from zero to two, we're very adamant about those things. From two to about seven, it's a little more loose, which again, you know, judgment, good, bad, otherwise. We're looking at observational. We're also looking at developing in different contexts. So in the daycare setting, you're also, again, similar to PE, you're working with people who haven't been trained to do this. So I'm a kines. You guys are all kines. We were trained quite heavily in how to assess. Can you imagine being given somebody and say, okay, go ahead and assess this person, even though you have no experience in how to do that? What world does that happen in? Oh, our world. It can't happen that way, but that's how it's going. That's why people have a bad experience. Anyways, so for the daycare setting, we need more training there to help support in order to value that because it's, it's crucial. If kids don't develop the skills they need, the social, emotional, as well as the physical, they're not going to be able to progress. And what do we hear from coaches so much now? The kids coming into the system, they have no athleticism and their desire is in the basement. So that's what we're hearing from coaches. They might be a superb hockey player. Superb. Their skill set in hockey is amazing because they've been doing it since they're three years old. But their athleticism overall, they have no transferable skills. They have no confidence outside of hockey. And they don't know how to work hard because all they had is their talent. So that's what we're bringing into this system. So yeah, 100%, I fully agree we need to assess. In the, in the recreation space, again, I've done a lot of work in that area. One of the challenges is, and you mentioned it, Daryl, with that consistent eye, and, and Matt, you said it all, as well. If we don't have the consistent eye, if I get an assessment day one and an assessment day 60 from different people, they don't necessarily match up. They're gonna say different things depending on what I've done is irrelevant because they're gonna, they're gonna be two different assessment people. So in the rec space, they don't have the time, the money, the personnel to be able to assess. So you know what we did? We hired in some sport organizations who have that coach's eye to be able to be the con consistent measurement for the program that they had. And it wasn't so much about assessing performance, it was about the practice of assessment. So in a, depending in a four week course, you're not necessarily gonna see huge performance increases, but you are gonna be able to give them some, some basics and some confidence pieces that say, you went from here to here. These are the skills you learned in these four weeks. And this is what we saw, congratulations. Here are some things to work on in the next four weeks. And you know who else we gave the assessment to? The kids and the parents, and they would come back to the rec center. Oh, my, my little Johnny and Janie need to work on these things. What courses do you have? What programs do you have that can help them develop that? And I'm gonna play what devil's advocate. What can, you be doing on your, what can you be doing outside on the weekends in your own backyards to help this? What, you, what should you be doing to, to, to foster that improvement? I really like what you said, uh, because Elisa, right up there uh, uh, with excuses and self-preservation in, in terms of my pet peeves uh, is the soccer coach with the big long Adidas jacket that's telling me in the middle of the field that has no, no piece of paper, no pen, no nothing for the $65 assessment that we've just brought our kid to. I got this, I'm eyeballing it. And then all the kids that were on the last year's team, high performance team, uh, I happened to make this year's high performance team. And I want to go out and start throwing haymakers. So uh, you know, the whole opinion-based, observation-based assessment, no, or don't buy it, especially if you're paying. 
uh, and in Daryl, you know, assessment at the beginning of the season, it should be a prerequisite. It needs to be a prerequisite because when we hear the terms and all these mission statements and organizations were about athlete development, my number one question to them is, okay, great. Are you baselining your athletes? Nope. Okay. Then don't, don't use the words athlete development because you have no idea if they've actually developed. And, and Elisa made a good point. Not only do you not have an idea, but they don't have an idea and their parents don't have an idea. So what do we do? We default to what's easy, the schedule, the score, and the standings. And that's how we base our opinion on the, the money that we're paying for organizations, the athlete development that our young, young kids, girls, and boys are getting. And that is a fallacy. That is a fallacy. You cannot base athlete development on the schedule, the score, and the standings. It's got nothing to do with anything. You could be in a league, and why? Because you could be in a league where you have a, you don't have as strong of players as somebody else does. And there's nothing you can do about that. You just don't have the strong players. So if your only measure of success is the championship, which we've already covered about outcome-based you know, markers for success, then you're going to have more losses than wins. Whereas if you're assessing each athlete at the beginning of the season and at minimum reviewing at the end of the season, ideally going beginning, middle, and end, then what you're going to see is fixes along the way. And Elisa, your point of sharing that information with all the stakeholders, coach, athlete, family, sport organization, administration, will guide how your coach education, will guide what you're doing, will guide so many other things that will make that experience, the quality sport experience, is so much better for athletes. And the last thing that I want to say before I pop down off the soapbox, kids love this. Kids love being assessed. They love assessment day. They love reassessment day. They love seeing where they are. This isn't a kid thing. This is an adult thing. This is an, this is an adult um, lack of confidence, like we've said, and, well, no, we can't give up a practice. We've got too much to cover. That's all you're supposed to be doing. What the hell else are you covering? And, and Elisa, you, you touched on it earlier. We jam the technical tactical down their throats. Why? Because we have no, we just don't know and we're not good at assessing those other components. So instead of actually learning how to assess them, we keep diving into the technical tactical. Oh, new article by so-and-so on plyometrics. Oh, here's the overland training, dry speed training. Have you trained with the snorkel yet? Look at this deadlift. <laughs> like we hammer the hell out of that because that's all we know. Enough of that stuff. That is 20%. Let's, let's put those force measures into a rubrics. We've got competence, we've got confidence, character, and connection. Four pillars, 25% each. So that equals 100%. If we're only diving into the competence, we're only getting 25% of athlete development for those who like pictures and for those who like numbers. You can find this stuff on Quality Sport Hub, Wade Gilbert's book, Coaching Better Every Season, the United States um, Coach Coach, uh, coach new coaching manual released in 2018. You can find it in the Canadian Sport Development Matrix. They've got the four matrices that are that are social, emotional, mental, psychological, uh, physical, technical, tactical, etc. So this information exists everywhere. You you don't have to do the whole 264 markers that some of these things have. You, you pick what's relevant for you. And again, that goes back to Daryl. What Daryl was saying. Have the ability to customize it. Elisa, you talk about it all the time. Get out of the box. Get out of checking your own box. Create your own evaluation system and then try it and then pivot if you don't like it. Uh, ask the athletes what their goals are. Bang, you're done. Question. I'm going to play devil's advocate for to both you guys. What if I'm a parent and say, I just want my kid to have fun. I dropped him off at this rec center so he can have fun. I don't care about this assessment. He's, I don't want to stress him out. What do you say to a kid like that or a parent like that? And he cares. He cares. They care. Don't put, your, don't put your baggage on them because you had a bad experience. They care. It's fun. Assessment can be fun. It can be a part of anything else. You want to get and, better. And they can get better. It's not about, and again, Elisa's hammered this so many times, it's not about high performance. It's not about the best and top athletes. It's not about taking young girls and boys and trying to make them all stars. Daryl, your story, it's ultimate Frisbee. And it's a disc, by the way. It's not a Frisbee. You taught them how to throw the disc. Uh, oh, it's yes. ultimate Frisbee. <laughs> you taught them how to throw a disc, okay? So was anyone in that class looking to go to the Canadian Ultimate Championship? Zero. No, 
they were looking at how do I hang out with my mates at the beach and, and have some activity and, and have some fun. So I think, you know, for parents that say they don't want assessment, it's too bad. We're offering it. This is what we're offering. And, and again, it's the framing. Again, it's, it's how you position it. Assessment is fun. Learning is fun. Um, it doesn't have to be rigorous. It doesn't have to be whistleblowing. It doesn't have to be that picture of a drill sergeant in your face yelling at you. Getting better is fun too. Again, if going back to the ultimate Frisbee story, when they got better, they had way more fun. They had those skills. And don't get me wrong, they were having fun in the beginning, but they could do more. The games were more meaningful to them. And, and they, you know, imagine I had a, a group of people that all they wanted to do was play basketball and shoot the ball and whatnot. And then it switched. Can we play ultimate Frisbee today? Can we play ultimate Frisbee today? And I laughed because none of them knew how to play at the beginning of the year. I didn't even know how to play. I had to learn how to throw the goddamn thing. So that is, again, taking this, the sport and making it enjoyable, fun. We always talk about that and, and making it something that they can do for the rest of their life. Oh, yeah. You know, so. fun, fun, fun is an outcome. And what you need to have fun are some skills and knowledge. Yes. You can't drop someone in an environment where they have no skills, no knowledge to be able to participate and expect them to just have fun. And, and I'll say this again, as the female on the panel, I can talk about this. I know so many girls who sit on the sidelines and they say, I don't want to participate. I don't want to participate. I don't want, and there's boys who do it as well. They just don't do it as much. The girls do it. And one of the reasons is they have no confidence to participate. But when you can make it fun, and fun can be, like you said, Matt, assessment can be fun. Play can be fun. Development can be fun. It can be awful as well. You can make it a terrible experience and no one's ever going to want to come back and see your face again. You can do that. Or you could take it and make it fun. The whole experience in itself might not be a barrel of monkeys. Like it just, the whole thing might not. Because you got to work hard. You got to break through some boundaries. You got to find yourself deep inside to be able to get somewhere you haven't been before. Once you get there, or even in the process, when you high five it and you're congratulating them and you're doing all the feedback that you're supposed to do as that coach, as that parent or that rec leader or that parent, you're going to make the process fun. It might be an uncomfortable process. We have, to, we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. As I mean, that's been said all over the place. Development can be uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable process. No one changes without pushing your change or, or without change, without pressure. So for our, in order for us to make it fun, we have to find the pieces in it that can increase that person's joy in an uncomfortable process. And the outcome of it will be exactly what you said, Daryl. They're gonna be able to participate. And that's fun. Participation without skills and knowledge is not fun and they won't participate. Yeah, so, and it's a really good question, Daryl. Like, I'm, gl I'm really glad you asked that because it is one of the reasons that parents avoid it. I just want to, it seems serious. It seems arduous. Yes. You know, it seems like it's way too formalized and, oh, this is only for high performers. My kid's not going to the pros. Could only high performers be evaluated? No, absolutely not. Everyone should be evaluated because everyone deserves to have that feeling that Elisa has just described of self-actualization because that's really what you're working towards. That's Maslow's highest hierarchy of needs, self-actualization, belief in yourself, um, and, and all the resilience pieces. And, and Elisa alluded to this earlier, was that we're, we continue to see a lack of resilience being reported with, with the younger people that are coming into the workplace, coming into the realities, because everything has been flattened. Uh, the, the, we and don't want to be evaluated. We don't want to get our evaluations back. We don't want to know if we're good enough. And all the cop-outs and shortcuts that we take Okay, we're just prolonging the inevitable. We can build resiliency. There's nothing wrong with starting somewhere, not being the best, and working your way towards it. You should be able to do that. So moving on to the last thing, because we're, we're kind of coming up to the end of time here, let's, let's talk about the different ways of quantifying that success. Because people, we know it doesn't work, zero to 10. So when we're going to evaluate young kids and we have a zero to 10, that's probably not the best way of getting them all excited, if 10's being the best or in zero's being the worst. So, you know, I know in the education system, they use a lot of rubrics, you know, and Elisa, you've got a lot of experience, initial, emerging, competent, and proficient. And why I like those rubrics, and I'll let you guys weigh in, is because it's a progression, and everyone should be starting at an initial level of competency, and then moving to 
emerging competent and proficient. So it is a pathway and a progression. It's not a zero to 10. Um, so I think that's one of the things that we have to be conscious of. I mean, if you're doing an event, how many push-ups? Well, okay, that's a numer there's a numeric value to that uh, and uh, speed or anything like that. So some of the physical things like agility, speed, endurance, balance, those are numerical numbers. But the, the soft skills, the developmental skills, the, 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 the character, the confidence and, and the connection, those need to be uh, put in rubrics so that we can explain to people that this is a progression. What do you guys think? I love it. I, you know why I, that rubrics it means a lot to me is because, as you said, when you throw someone a number, it makes them feel bad about themselves. It makes them feel bad or good about themselves. There's no in between. You give someone a, a five, you know, what does that mean? A five out of 10? Does that mean I don't know what I'm doing? Does it mean I'm, I, I kind of know what I'm doing? The, the initial, well, I'm just starting. I, don't, I haven't achieved this goal yet or I haven't uh, attained the skill emerging it's getting better i'm 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 somewhat get on my way to to being competent i i love it and i think it's a way easier way for people to absorb it and not take it as uh you know criticism or like, like we we always talk about feedback is just feedback this is where he is on the continuum or she this is where he or she is on the continuum that's all we're trying to say and by the end of the year we'd like them to be competent that's our goal. Or when they leave grade school or by the end of this year, we want everybody on our hockey team or soccer team or wherever it is to be at least in the competent box. And if you're not, I didn't do a good job as a coach. We forget our client. These guys are clients. We don't, the players, we don't think of them, but our goal is to assess them, figure out where they are, and then we make a plan. Isn't yeah. that it? Isn't that true, Lise? That's the whole point. Make it, deliver an assessment. And there's, there's, there's a variety of assessments you can do for a variety of ages. One of the questions I want to ask you guys is, at what age do assessment gets become more the numerical side? Because there's a point where it's, especially in sports, where you're going to go from assessments being a little bit more rubric-based, and they're, they're, you know, you're here today, and you're based in a you versus you, and that's where it starts. And then there's a point, I don't know if it's college or high school or pro sports, where it becomes, you are a number. I want to know how much you can bench. I want to know how fast you can run a 20-yard dash. I want to know these numbers. So there is a point where those are there. And we do need to prepare people for that if they have those goals that they want to reach. You know, I want to, I want to see how much I can do. So kids love that. I want to see how much I can do. But we need to frame it as well with the other components of it. You pushed really hard today. Why was CrossFit so successful with personal best? They, they pumped personal best. What is your personal? It's how good you are today. That's how good you are today versus how good you were yesterday. That is your personal best. Not your, your best against Jody over here or Johnny over there. Your personal best is very important. And when we're looking at assessment, we're saying, the reason I'm doing this, and we need to explain it. I have a really quick story for you guys about not being explained properly and how damaging it can be. I had a coach. And this was, this was actually in school. We were instructor in school. So we were students trying to learn different things. And we had to go through some of our programming, do some sport things. So we were all doing things we'd never been done before or used to. And we had to learn how to do it. The instructor would sit in the stands. We would do some kind of performance of whatever we were supposed to do. And he would yell a number at us for what our performance was. 68, 45, 79. I'm not even joking. That's all he would do. That's all he would give you. When you would ask, well, what can I, what did I do wrong? What can I do to get better? You know, you didn't do enough of what I wanted to see. That was it. That is terrible. That's some old school coaching. Unhelpful. 100%. So it can be bad, but it also can be really, if he had come and sat with us and showed us the rubric and showed us what to work on and how to improve and had a video of our performance. See here, when you did this, you need to do this instead next time. There's so many ways we can do it. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be complicated. And if you don't know, or you don't know where to get the resources, reach out to somebody who does. There's a lot of people out there who have this expertise. Don't be afraid to ask them and call out and say, how can I do this? And again, remember the reason you're doing this is not so you can get someone to the podium. The reason you're doing this is to have them a measure for growth. I want to have this little person grow in those four ways. How can I do that? 
what resources and tools can I use and how do I change them? And then develop, like you said, Daryl, that rubric is going to help develop the program we need to get everybody where they want to go. And I'm telling you, when you do that, that is fun as hell, man. I, I think that's a better way of measuring phys ed. It, yeah. Whatever unit they're doing, that, that would be a better, better way than giving them an A or B. I think so. Because it, it would make more sense to them, to the, to the, to the, the uh, stakeholder. It would make way more sense to them. Either they're initial emerging or they're competent or, or proficient. It would make way more sense. Um, your question, real quick, I'll, I'll address that with the numeric. I, because I've tested high performance athletes in terms of pro guys going on their way to the pro. I think that's where it really matters when you're, you're being selective and who you're taking and you want to compare apples to apples and, and, and sort of see at the younger age, I, the number is nice, but it's not used the same way. And that's in my experience. I'm not, I, I don't want to talk for you, Matt, or anybody else out there. But that's how I see it. When, you, when you're heading off to the pros or whatnot and they need to compare who's the fastest person on the field here, I need to see that. And I want to see if they're efficient. I want to see, you know, that's where I think it matters in that, in that sense. Anywhere Good. else, I don't think, it, I don't know. I don't think it matters. I think it's, you're just, you're just trying to see where you were and where you are now. I'm counterpunching. I'm counterpunching. I'm, I'm coming in hot. I'm counterpunching. Uh -oh. Because what do we see now in the U.S. college system? They are recruiting based on character, based on connection, the relationships with the parents. You know why? Because they, if you have the biggest, fastest, and strongest, and they're a ham sandwich, then they just become a problem for you. And so what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a lot more holistic assessments and time spent really trying to understand these young men and women's character. Uh, because that's going to save time and energy. You're giving out a $50,000 scholarship, you, you, you got to need to know who the person is. And, you know, we see it all the time in other professions, i.e., you know, and it's such a good question that was asked because you look at what's happening with physicians right now. you got the physicians that know the body and are 98% but have zero bedside manner. That's not the physician that you want. You want the physician that, that smoked weed and admitted it. You want the physician that has a well-rounded, you know, toolbox and toolkit that can have a conversation that can take feedback. That's really what you want. So I would argue and counterpunch that this should be something that's continued all the way out through the system so that you don't have, I mean, I mean the element. most recent yeah, yeah. hockey player that had his Instagram hacked and he's talking disparagingly, disparagingly against his teammates, against women, against everybody. Who wants that guy? Beat it. What, if you know, if you would have known that, would you have drafted that guy? Uh-uh. So now he's I mean, been- I mean, as part of their assessment. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I get what you're saying. I, that's not the only thing I'm looking at. For sure. You're right. But you're right. Yeah, it should be all the way through, Elisa. So I think it's something, and, and the more we get it into the, the development level in the early stages, the more people become used to that as a way of evaluating, just like you do at any other job. Here's your requirements. Here's your list. Here's your task. Here's your timeline. Here's your deadline. Did you meet it? Yes, no. Here's the repercussion, blah, blah, blah. Like, come on, man. Yeah, 100%. You nailed it. I think mean, you're right. And Daryl, it's, it's this. way more. You said the same thing. Yeah, you said the same thing and keep away. You added to it, Matt, because you're saying what we do now is we look at the number as the be-all and end-all. That's right. all that matters is the number. You know what? Because it's easy. Why do you think we use Scantron in schools? It's easy. It's not the best easy. assessment. It's easy and it's cheap to deliver. When we look at assessing those four areas, it's hard. This is hard yeah. work. Not impossible, but it's valuable. Anything of value takes work. It's hard. But we need to do it because it's so critical. You want to build a good team if, in a team sport, or you want to have an athlete that can handle all kinds of things that come at them, not just their, their physical skill set when they get out there on the stage or in life, never mind an athlete, just a life person who's out there wandering around trying to navigate life. They need to have those four elements locked down, not just one. I want someone, if someone comes to me, like you said, my same concept, so I'm going to take it to a life setting. Someone comes to me at a university and says, I got A plus in all my courses. I am the best engineer to do the job. But I can't take what I know theoretically in the book and I can't apply it in real world and I don't have any kind of personal relationship opportunity development. They're going to fail in business. They're going to fail in practice and they're going to fail within themselves because they have no confidence to deliver even though they know what to do. So we need to have the whole gamut. 
And I think that's where we, when you're trying to wrap up this conversation, we're looking at two things. One, assessment needs to be framed in a positive way, in a valuable way for measurement of growth. That's number one. And number two, what we're assessing and what we're looking at as valuable figures needs to be expanded beyond that one number. So the one number is important. I agree with you, Matt. We need to bring it from the very beginning because kids have anxiety around testing and assessment now. As soon as you bring it up, say, okay, today is assessment day, there's a bunch of kids that fall to pieces because they have so much anxiety about it. But if we, if we bring them along, like the woman on the treadmill, if we bring them along slowly in a positive way, and I'm not talking about using kid gloves with everybody, but I am talking about framing this in a way that it's a positive it's hard. Don't get me wrong. Don't sugarcoat it. It's hard. It's going to work. You might get a little upset about this, but the end result is something positive. So those, those are my two. We're talking about next steps, first steps. Next steps, Matt, for you. Yeah. Next steps. Let's, 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 if you're a physical educator or a sports, decide on an assessment um, test or evaluation test or whatever adjective you want to use that aligns with your values and can give the, the young men and women, the young athletes, the young players, the young students, some perspective and, and context of where they're starting and, and where, they, where they have made improvements and achievements and where they ultimately finish that, that season. And without it, again, if you ain't assessing, you guess it. And we need to stop guessing and we need to start doing more of that because it is a very, very positive um, step. So again, it doesn't have to be overcomplicated. Don't overthink it. Don't share it on social media so you get shamed for having a test that someone doesn't believe is evidence-based validated. Just do your own thing and make sure you're asking the young men and women on their side, your goals. I, w- I want to know, so, so this is what I want to get through, but I also want some of your goals because the more you can personalize it, the better you're going to be. I love it. I, I'm going to add to that. I, I will take, I'll take that and as part of my uh, uh, first steps, we need to get better at observation with our, our, our athletes, teachers, you know what I mean? And, and if that means you got to learn the assessment yourself and understand what, what it is, the, the different stages, initial, emerging, uh, competent, uh, confident, um, proficient, you, you need to learn that. And we need to get better at assessing that and sharing that information with these kids in a way that they can take it and not feel like it's a punishment. And, and, and when, you, when you give a kid feedback on where they are, basically they're the client. As I said before, they're the client and all we wanna do is help the client succeed. And if we can put it in that framework, hey, here's where you are, here's, here's how you can get better. And we're gonna, we'll, we'll check you later on, but here's the things you can do in the meantime. And then when, when you're done there, we'll, we'll, we'll redo this again and see where you're at. And that is where we need to be in school, in sports organization, in rec centers, because if we have more people that are getting better and having fun and, in, and, and improving and developing, we're gonna have more people playing. And on that note, we'll have people just saying, just go play. That's what we're gonna have. So, you. what do you think? What do you think, guys? That was awesome today. Perfect. Well done. Lot, hey, reach out to us. Lot was said. Lot was said. If you guys like this podcast, please share with your friends, family, people who you think this would be, uh, you know, something that they can take away and and use tomorrow. Please share this, guys. Thank you, guys. We were awesome as usual. I, I love our discussions. On that note, time's up. Time's up. Your beep is going off. Bye.